Good evening. The Jackson Public School Board meeting is now called to order. Board members, we have five members present. Uh, Dr. Hairston is on the phone and the other four are in the boardroom. Uh, Mr. Figures is on his way and will be here shortly. Therefore, we have a quorum. We have all had an opportunity to review the agenda. Is there a motion to adopt the agenda as presented? So moved. Second. Mrs. Thompson has moved. Mr. McGuffey has seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 The motion carries. We have all had an opportunity to review the minutes. Is there a motion to approve the November 9, 2023 regular board meeting minutes and the November 14th special board meeting minutes of 2023? So moved. Second. Mrs. Thompson has moved. Ms. Hillard has seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 The motion carries. Dr. Green with the superintendent's report. Thank you, Dr. Sivak. Good evening, board members to our JPS administrators and team members, parents, community members, scholars, all of those who are joining us this evening. Um, we'll begin as we typically do with our uh, latest news from our, our JPS instructional television team. A big turnout for the JPS Special Programs Fair, where unique learning opportunities were on full display. Parents get an opportunity to kind of peruse and meet um, our program specialists, our program principals. The Special Programs Fair allowed scholars and families to meet with educators and ask questions. Our goal is to try to meet every scholar where they are and help them to find a home in one of our schools in one of our programs. Programs that are compelling, high quality, and ones that help our scholars find themselves. 21 mini grants ranging from $430 to $10,000, totaling $100,000, awarded to Jackson Public Schools by the Junior League of Jackson and the Community Foundation for Mississippi. Increased student achievement to support the curriculum and then to provide creative and a resource for activities for scholars. And this is one of the, the biggest things that the Junior League does in the community and we're so blessed to be a part of it. JPS educators will be able to implement creative and innovative projects that will have a positive impact on early literacy, children's health, and social development. It's amazing to see their hearts and their hands to the wonderful work that they do to raise money to say, you have an idea, here's the money, go forth and do it. JPS recently hosted the Parent and Family Engagement Homecoming. We have sessions and workshops planned for you, and what we want to do is just to empower you with information. Prepare scholars for kindergarten because we want them to be kindergarten ready. You can scan these QR codes, and it'll give you practice with the vocabulary. Hundreds of parents passionate about education learned about programs and opportunities to bridge education between school and the community. The Parent and Family Engagement Homecoming was an opportunity for families and educators to come together to begin the process of building relationships and to discover programs to empower JPS scholars for success. We are here to give parents strategies and materials to help their children at home. Parents attend a session, learn how to use these resources, and then walk away with those resources. Army National Guard is where I'm going, and after I come home from training, I think I'm going to stay in state and probably attend either Mississippi State or Southern Miss. Jim Hill High School scholar Dana Bolden, accepted by dozens of colleges and awarded millions of dollars in scholarships. She sets an example of JPS academic excellence on the national scene at the Jennifer Hudson Talk Show. For more information about Jackson Public Schools, please visit our website at jackson.k12.ms.us. Follow us on Facebook at Jackson Public Schools, on Instagram at JPS Student Voices, on Twitter at JPS District, Comcast channels 18 and 19, and YouTube at youtube.com slash JPSITV. As always, we want to thank the team for for uh, those updates. Um, it's always nice to see some of those programs. The, the days and weeks seem to run long, and so sometimes you forget some of these amazing things that have already happened. It's like, oh, wow, that was just in the last few weeks, <laughs> that program. Um, so lots of great things happening throughout Jackson <coughs> Public Schools, and again, thank you for capturing those and, and um, 
elevating those here. Um, board members, I, I won't keep you long with my remarks this evening. Um, just been thinking as we barrel towards the holiday season and the close of this, uh, this calendar year and, and um, this semester, just some thoughts about where we are, what we've, where we've been, and uh, hopefully where we're going. Um, board members, as you know, this, is, this has been a challenging school year um, already. And in many ways, just forcing us to navigate significant issues like the testing irregularities and our optimization plan in an effort to try and operate our district most efficiently and effectively. And still, our priority has been and will continue to be on our children. I've had the opportunity to network over the last few weeks especially um, and, and learn alongside many talented superintendents from across the country. And all of them are facing similar challenges as Jackson Public Schools, whether it's violent crimes in the communities, uh, teacher shortages, and yes, even declining enrollments. And as we approach the end again of this sem first semester and of this calendar year, I just want to take this moment to remind us all that it's important to continue to focus on our scholars, to focus on that six-year-old who deserves an excellent uh, educational experience every day, that senior who is finishing their K-12 experience and preparing for the next steps in their lives, and every scholar in between. Um, with all that we're dealing with as adults just in the world, all the conflict and just all the strife, all that we're dealing with as people, um, educators, leaders, scholars, we have to remain focused on providing an excellent education for all JPS scholars. And so for Team JPS, my urging is that we <coughs> remember that we have today we have today, we don't know about tomorrow, but we have today to bring our very best in teaching and leading and supporting. To our scholars, you have today. Again, we don't know about tomorrow, but you do have today to get the most out of your learning experiences. And to our parents and other adults and community members and leaders throughout Jackson, today is the day for us to ensure that our scholars have what they need, that they're ready for school in the mornings and that they're safe as they move from home to school and back home again, and that they have the resources that they need to be their best selves and to meet with great success. So again, just, you know, um, as we're coming to the close of, of this first semester and this calendar year, just thinking about just the gratitude for all of the, just everything that we have and all the opportunities that we have available to us. Um, and even through the challenging times that we have faced and likely will face from now on, um, just because such is life, just understanding that we do have today to see those opportunities, to seize those opportunities, and to ensure that no stone is left unturned as we endeavor to best serve our children and families. That's what I have for you this evening. Dr. Sivak, thank you. Um, turn the meeting back over to you. Thank you, Dr. Green. Thank you for those words of encouragement um, during this season. Um, we will now move on to our public comments. Um, we do have comments tonight, board members. Um, I'll also remind um, uh, the community that, that anyone who would like to make public comments should email their request to Ms. Rosalind Williams at roswilliams at jackson.k12.ms.us no later than 4 p.m. on the day of the meeting or appear in person in the boardroom no later than 5.15 p.m. the day of the meeting. Um, uh, I just want to, um, as we get ready to start, of course, um, there will be three minutes for comments. <laughs> Attorney Turner uh, keeps the minutes um, and uh, will keep time. Uh, the board uh, believes the public comment is very important. We will listen and consider comments. We will not respond at this time. Uh, if there is an issue that has not been taken to leadership at a particular school or to administration, we encourage this. 
Also, all of us can be reached at our email addresses on the JPS website. Uh, so, Attorney Turner, um, if you could uh, begin the comments. Board members, you have three persons who have signed up to address you this evening. The first is Mr. Baba Lucada, who would like to address you on a curriculum suggestion. Good evening. Good evening. Somewhere I read that if we want our children to know economics, self-sufficiency, then education is the key. We would hope that somewhere in the, in the very near future, we will begin to teach our students financial literacy, starting from elementary, elevating that education in middle school, and capping it in high school. It's very important that we start to think about the elimination of poverty in Jackson. In addition, <clears throat> we would hope that the board and the superintendent would consider more opportunity for community input in assisting with the education of our children. I know that it is a risk to invite community people into the buildings, but there are still some of us who are concerned and bring legitimate support to the students that we can bring into the, into the building. Finally, we would hope that with the closure, the proposed closure of the schools, that we would recognize that it would also bring in mind the possibility of the reduction of the top heavy administration of the district. We understand that there were two bond issues that were approved for district building repairs. We would also like to see some accountability for the funds that were uh, received through those bond issues and compare that to how these schools stand in terms of their physical maintenance. Finally, we want you to be aware that with the closure of schools and the mixing of students from various neighborhoods, we need to develop a plan to prepare ourselves for the potential of increased violence in our schools due to rivalries that exist in neighborhoods. And if we think about that in advance, then I think we'll be better prepared. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Licata. Mm -hmm. Next is Meredith Coleman McGee against the closure of schools. Hello, everyone. Thank you for your service. I have two questions. <coughs> One is, is it possible that instead of closing the school, you could let the children just walk to the nearest school instead of closing it? The second one is, is it possible that you could get the money that followed the kids to the charter school to come back to JPS? Mm -hmm. uh, do we have any kind of way to uh, get that done? And secondly, school closures is not good for the community. I started JPS at Pond Dexter, 69, 70, first grade. Back then, I could walk to the playground. We lived two blocks from the school. And I just went up Ash Street at 4.30 this evening. For the, first, uh, the last time I went up Ash Street, I was going to Brown to volunteer for uh, a reading fair. And my niece graduated from Rowan Valedictorian, uh, fifth grade. And to, I was, I'm still shocked. I, wore, I drove up Ash Street and saw all these boarded buildings, the houses that used to be occupied by people across from the schools, vacant, vacant, vacant. I went down this street, vacant, vacant, vacant. Streets are bad. How, uh, 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 um, trees and houses, I went to this street. Vacant, vacant, vacant. So to me, your decision to close schools does it, 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 the aftermath of it hurts our community. I went to a bar, bought it up, bought it up, bought it up. And that's not, not helping us at all. 
to close schools. You say you don't have no money, get the money. Mm -hmm. Aren't boys supposed to raise money, get the money some kind of way? Because it's killing Jackson. If you close any more schools, you're going to cut off an economic arm and leg in the city of Jackson. And I am utterly, completely against closing any more schools in the city of Jackson, and I pay taxes. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. McGee. Finally, Nathan Bryant, future use of Chastain Middle School facilities. Good evening. Yeah. Uh, my name is Nathan Bryant. I serve as the lead pastor at Grace City Church, which um, occupies a building directly across the corner from Chastain Middle School. Uh, you may know that that school has had to evacuate three times this fall because of a strong gas smell. And it was actually last week when I got to meet Dr. Evans, the assistant superintendent, who encouraged me to come and speak to you guys this evening. I'm here tonight as a leader and representative of a church who's fallen in love with the administration, the faculty, the teachers, and the scholars of the Chastain family. We literally love that school. Uh, I'm also a strong proponent of public education. Both my parents were public school teachers for their entire career. And back in Texas, there's actually an elementary school named for my parents. Uh, my wife's a public school teacher, and I believe in what you guys do. I also know better than most how difficult your job is, and you don't get the credit or the grace that you should, so I appreciate you. Uh, in January of 2022, God led my family to move from Texas to Jackson so I can serve at the church I'm at. But I'm starting to believe that I might be a part of something even greater than I dreamed of at that time, something that will outlive my tenure at the church and potentially your tenure in serving in this district. Uh, when I first heard that you were going to consider closing Chastain, I'll be honest, it was a punch to the gut. I love that school very much. Some of my favorite experiences over the past two years come from the time that we've spent feeding the teachers, uh, cleaning the school the day before classes start last year, painting the teacher's lounge, attending the city championship basketball game, uh, emceeing the eighth grade graduation program. Principal Terrell and her staff have opened their hearts up to us, and we love that school. In fact, my student, Patrick Kincaid, is here with me tonight. He was in a volunteer assistant coach for the football team, and yes, they won the city championship this fall, so you can thank Kincaid if you'd like when we're done. <laughs> but the prospect of seeing this school close has been hard to swallow, and I know that your decision is tough, and I understand even after talking to Ms. Terrell, that's probably the right thing to do, and so I, I appreciate what you're doing. Uh, but if that school closes, it doesn't change anything about our heart for that community and the families that make up that school, which brings me to what I hope you will see as a real opportunity. The building and property used by Chastain is both amazing and challenging. You know as well as I do how much work it needs. I've been very encouraged to read and hear that leaders like yourself and local leaders, uh, state leaders, all want to see these facilities used for something like community enrichment. I heard the lady before me just talk about how hard it would see, be to see these schools closed up forever. And so I'm here tonight to ask that when you're ready to consider options for how the Chastain facility be used in the future, you'd consider myself and Grace City Church a worthwhile partner in seeing our shared dream realized. I know it's going to take resources and partnerships beyond my current network here in Jackson, uh, but I'm willing to work and, uh, and do everything I can to see that school become a home for things like a new library. Uh, home for adult education, after school programs, a venue for community and select <laughs> sports, potentially a new location for Precinct 4 of the Jackson Police Department, and yes, perhaps even a place where Grace City Church can continue to gather until Jesus comes back. So I'm here to tell you we're ready to introduce myself and let you know that we want what you want, to see Chastain Middle School become something that serves the families of the North Fonder community and makes that community one of the strongest in the city. So if you're looking for a partner in community development, someone who's going to lead the charge in revitalizing one neighborhood in your district, I really hope you'll find us worthy and ready for the job. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Okay, board members, um, we will now move on to our information items only. Um, the first item is a review of the final optimization plan recommendation. Dr. Green will present this information. Dr. Green. Thank you, Dr. Sivak. Sorry. Um, I will attempt to, um, I do want to provide a, a complete um, review of the optimization plan to you board members. I know some of this you've seen and other times, and I'll try not to be completely redundant, but I do want to, for the record, present the 
um, our finalized uh, recommendations to you. And so as we've discussed previously, um, you know, these are our core values. We um, work very hard to live into these core values. Um, and there are a few of them that rise to the top as we discuss and consider um, optimization of our, our district and how best to serve our children. When we um, are having this conversation about optimization or right sizing, we, um, we know that there are those who just don't understand or don't believe that there's a need for something such as this. And so we want to keep in front of us um, the rationale and the reasons why. Our goal here is for no other reasons really than to ensure that our school facilities work that they operate <clears throat> effectively and that they provide for the best learning environment for our scholars. And also that um, our teams, that we've got a strong staffing complement of folks who are able and willing and knowledgeable um, and caring and all those things to serve our children and provide them with the kind of educational experiences that they deserve. And that will help to position them well in life. And then lastly, that um, we have an opportunity to reinvest in our programs <clears throat> through the, the buildings themselves, the facilities that we offer, but also having the flexibility in our budgets um, to provide for the kind of programs and resources that our scholars deserve to have robust and um, compelling learning experiences. Um, as we've shared previously, uh, districts are funded per pupil. We are funded based on the number of scholars that you have in the district and more to the point here in Mississippi, not only the ones that you have enrolled in your district, but the one, the numbers of scholars who attend. Um, and not to go too deep into this, but part of our reality is a declining enrollment, but another piece of our reality that is uh, very real and, and that you know um, many urban districts are working through is because of some of the life circumstances, our scholars are not always in attendance in schools, and yet we must staff them and heat them and cool them and um, have the electricity and water and everything else that we need for the days that they do arrive. Unfortunately, a part of our funding formula requires that, um, or is impacted by their attendance, their daily attendance. But schools are funded by the number of students uh, who are enrolled in the district and who are enrolled in each individual school. And so, um, as we understand it, uh, those those um, shared costs, those base costs, um, fixed costs that each school has, that's um, the central office uh, staffing, the leadership, our uh, custodial staffing, the lights, the heating and cooling, the water bills, all of that is shared across the number of scholars that we have in the building. And that's whether we have 100 scholars in that building or 300. Um, and so, of course, with a smaller enrollment, we are paying more per student in that building, which limits our ability to do the things that we discussed earlier, making sure that the buildings work, making sure that we've got the staffing appropriate for our scholars' needs and um, the kind of programming that our scholars deserve. So we've talked through previously the various rationales for optimization or right-sizing in the district. And they include all of these, um, ensuring that, uh, or obviously because of our declining enrollment, we've got to react to and, and rethink our operations. Um, we have significant facilities investments that are required in most of our buildings, not just the ones that we've proposed for closure or consolidation. Most of our buildings require continued investments and significant investments. Um, we've shared previously that each year, um, while we've gotten better and better over time because of some of the partnerships and some of the uh, investments we've made in salaries and compensation because of some of the stipends that we offer, because of um, the, the, the grow your own efforts that we have, we've gotten better at 
um, identifying and hiring and 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 um, maintaining uh, stronger staffing but it's hard for all school systems to to staff schools and to staff districts um, it's there's a shortage of teachers there's a shortage of educators and and we're not immune to that shortage that's being experienced across the country and so this is an effort for us to also better position ourselves to compensate and to support our educators and to provide them with uh, teaching and working um, um, environments that, that they appreciate as well. As well as bolstering um, school programs, increasing our competitiveness across athletics, academics, the arts, you name it, um, rethinking and, and better positioning us to uh, utilize our Title I funding, that's the federal funds that we have to address some of the particular needs that we find in many of our schools. And then, of course, um, this opportunity to rethink how we use um, our buildings and how we offload or repurpose our buildings um, such that we don't have the carrying costs um, related to them. Again, we've shared um, lots of data in the past, but just want to keep in front of us all, we're not making these numbers up. This is just from 2015, 2016. Actually, if we go back further, um, I as I understand it, <coughs> Earlier in the uh, 2000s, we had up, upwards of 31 plus thousand scholars in our district. But just since 25 or 2015, 2016 school year, um, uh, we have lost um, nearly 10,000, and and more than that if we go further back in years. And so, this is a pretty significant change to our district. Um, it's about a third of our district that we've lost. It's a little more than a third, actually, of our, our scholars that we've lost. And although we've, we've uh, had some situations where we've had to close schools because of this facilities issue or that facilities issue um, or, or some other issue, uh, we have not adjusted our operations to a third um, of the scholars that we once had, and that's just our reality. <clears throat> and so, um, you know, as you know, we came to you previously in October with um, with a number of um, with a set of recommendations, um, schools that we believe uh, should be closed or consolidated, and um, feeder patterns that we wanted to rethink. And we committed at that time to go back and. Um, have some conversation with community members about the specifics of that optimization fl optimization plan. Specifically, um, you know, prior to that, we've been sounding the alarm that hey, we, um, you know, because of these enrollment declines, our our budget has shifted and we can't continue to afford the things or to operate in the ways that we have been. But now that we've named specific schools. Um, we've had this opportunity to go back and uh, meet with members of the community and, and hear from them, um, those who believe this is necessary, those who believe it's absolutely wrong, and everyone in between. Um, and we've taken that feedback. Uh, we've gone back to uh, look again at um, some of the data that we've been reviewing, some of the um, contextual information and, and feedback that we've gotten, the, the serious concerns, um, numerous concerns that folks have, have named for us. And so what I'm sharing tonight is um, a revised optimization plan um, and one that is um, cognizant of the feedback that we've received to date. Um, and concerns about any changes, let alone the, the amount of change that we originally proposed. And so here we are with um, the updated optimization plan. These are the schools that we're recommending for closure and consolidation. Dawson, Lake, Lester, Marshall, Rains, Sykes, Shirley, G.N. Smith, Chastain, Witten, and Wingfield. Those schools are recommended for closure consolidation 
in the fall for the fall of 2024. Due to ongoing um, uh, renovations and delays and um, just challenges in the and the the complexity of the work that's being done at Bailey uh, Middle School, um, our proposal is that Obama be uh, relocated to um, Northwest Middle, but not until fall of 2025. And the same with um, Wells APAC, that it be relocated to the New Bailey building in fall of 2025, which would allow us more time to complete the renovations and um, have all the moving parts fall together. And so this is, uh, again, the updated consolidation, um, closure and consolidation list. You'll recall that um, Clausel was listed previously. We got some feedback of, re, with regard to a, um, an apartment complex that was very near or just across from that, that school. And we went back to verify the number of scholars who were attending school there from that apartment complex. And it's a s fairly significant number. Um, and we do believe that, that um, to close that school uh, given that and, and some recent uh, renovations there and um, numbers of scholars who attend other schools even that, that it just makes sense to maintain Clausell Elementary. We also got feedback with regard to, we got feedback on many of these schools, if not all of the schools, most of them. Um, but we also got feedback uh, regarding Green Elementary School um, and some of the work that's happening there and um, scholars attending the school from the neighborhoods and the fee as well as the feeder pattern up uh, through Kirksey and on to uh, Callaway and we were convicted that um, that was a school that we needed to um, you know not include in this set of recommendations but to watch and um, you know with concerns of course continue concerns about enrollment but um, to support for a bit longer. And then um, lastly, we uh, included Key Elementary School in the original set of recommendations. Um, and there again, we got a lot of feed, <coughs> excuse me, a lot of feedback about the position of the school, um, the uh, opportunities for um, a school there in that location. Um, and of course, again, the feeder pattern um, that it sits in. And um, while we do have some concerns about the building, um, we are uh, willing to go back and, and reinvest in that building and, and try to build it back up um, to serve the scholars there. Um, this, of course, would decrease somewhat at least the number of schools um, that we've been looking at for closure and consolidation and, and repurposing um, of those buildings. Um, there are also some other strategic conversations that we're having with members of the community and, and um, some of the leaders in the community around these buildings in particular and some opportunities there. Um, and so this is, is where we've, we've landed. Um, just to review, the feeder patterns would look like this. For High, Callaway High School, uh, Green, North Jackson, Kirksey, and part of Powell Middle uh, would articulate to Callaway. For Forest Hill, Bates, Oak Forest, Timberlawn, Van Winkle, and the uh, two elementaries served at the Witten Building um, uh, uh, along with Cardozo and, and Peoples would articulate up to Forest Hill. Um, and it's actually part of Peoples, not all of it. And of course, um, Wingfield High School would be merged with Forest Hill. For Jim Hill High School, the um, elementaries would be Isabel, Key, Wilkins, Obama Elementary uh, Magnet. In Blackburn, 
Northwest IB and part of the people's uh, population would articulate to Jim Hill. <coughs> For Lanier, Lanier High School, uh, junior and senior high school, um, Galloway Elementary, Johnson Elementary, and Walton Elementary would articulate to uh, Lanier and actually I believe uh, part of Powell as well for the sixth graders would articulate to Lanier. Um, so we'll, we'll need to update that. For Murrah High School, Boyd, Casey, McLeod, McVilly, Span, and Wells, APAC would be the elementaries articulating up to the, in the Murrah um, feeder pattern. Along with uh, Bailey, APAC, Middle, and part of the Powell um, population. And so um, in this case, I know previously we had um, entertained uh, Chastain, <coughs> excuse me, Chastain merging with, um, with Bailey um, and operating much as we do at Murrah, um, the APAC program along with the um, regular or general education program. Um, with some of the other changes that we've considered and, and looking again at uh, capacity levels in the other middle schools, we're confident that we can serve all of the Chastain scholars at um, Kirksey and Powell, rezoning there, and then from there, uh, some of the scholars from Powell would be rezoned to Murrah. And some of them, of course, um, would be zoning up, as we said previously, up to um, up to Callaway. All right. And so, in effect, just to be really clear, so in effect, Bailey would remain an APAC, an all APAC school, um, and Powell would become the the neighborhood middle school for um, a broader catchment area and feed into a couple of um, high schools. And then Provine High School would be fed by John Hopkins Elementary, Pecan Park, the newly renovated, beautified Pecan Park, and uh, Blackburn Middle. All right. I do want to uh, uh, keep in front of us because we've made some shifts and, and made some adjustments to the um, the 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 schools uh, <coughs> impacted by this plan. I want to provide some updated financials. You've seen this previously. Again, the argument is the more students you have in the in a building, the more you can <coughs> the more you can spread those costs across those students. The less students, the more you pay per student in a building. With the shifts that we've made, um, obviously we the the trending data is still the same. The enrollment decline has um, been to the tune of nearly sixty million dollars. Our payments to charters have been approaching fifty million at forty eight point one million. Total funding loss over the last um, several years since the fiscal year 2016, um, 107.7 .7 million, average loss of 12 million a year. With the adjustments that we've made, the estimated personnel cost reductions uh, tally about 4.3, uh, 4.29 million, um, which is down from about 6.4, I believe it was, uh, previously. And so again, as we took a few of those schools off and, and made some shifts, um, this is the, uh, the tally. The estimated operational uh, cost avoidance, again, these are not dollars that, um, not all of these dollars are currently being spent, but they would need to be spent if we were to continue to operate in all of our current buildings. And so, again, looking at um, the, the current list with some of those buildings uh, taken off, um, we're down to $8.06 million in cost avoidance. I want to be really clear. This, this, these are dollars that we would avoid spending if we're not operating schools in all of the buildings that we've listed in the, um, 
optimization plan. This is, um, <clears throat> excuse me, you've seen this list before. We've updated the list again with the, um, with the we've updated the list um, with the current uh, schools that are being recommended for closure consolidation um, and the total renovation costs uh, sitting at 124.13 million um, for the remaining buildings. And, and you may recall it was up to 175, just over 175 million with the other schools listed as well. Uh, we've shared this before, but not in all of the venues, and so I wanted to um, share this again. I know it's hard to see from a distance. The point here is that um, we have what is called our, um, um, our fund balance. And the fund balance is um, required, 7.5, I believe, is the requirement, annual uh, a requirement that we maintain 7.5% of our, our funds um, in this fund balance, and that could be used for emergencies or for you know any number of things. Um, that's the reason for having it. Um, and uh, we had been maintaining um, pretty much um, around the 20, 19 to 20 million um, for a few years there, and. Um, Unfortunately, though, with um, after the year 2021, fiscal year 2021, um, we, because of our costs, because of our lost uh, enrollment, because of the states um, truing up our payments to the uh, current enrollment uh, following the pandemic, there were some, some waivers that were issued during that time. Um, Truing up all of that data, we, um, we found ourselves in a situation in the last two years um, where we had to offset our fund balance using federal dollars. Um, folks will understand we got a lot of federal dollars to help us to deal with some of our facilities needs, um, to, of course, to help with our scholars. Um, building back and, and accelerating their educational um, uh, attainment and progress. Um, and one of the allowances with those federal dollars is to realize uh, some percentage of those funds as um, um, indirect costs. And it's using those indirect costs that we were able to shore up our fund balance to the tune of about $6 million uh, to 6.4 million over the last couple of years. And so the, the larger point here is as we've continued to decline in enrollment and in decline in uh, funding, um, we've not yet trued up our operational costs for the district in order to um, keep in line with that decline in funding. We've been able to um, manage over the last couple of years and build up the, the fund balance with those federal dollars, but those federal dollars go away in the fall of 2024. And so it's just another reason why this is so critical for us to um, take these steps now. So um, with, with all of the concerns that we've heard and we shared a lot of the feedback uh, at the last meeting, I believe, um, concerns about you know class sizes, concerns about, um, and you heard you you continued to hear some of the concerns about safety, um, and wanting to make sure that the scholars could get along. If you brought different groups of scholars together in a building, um, concerns about you know why has the enrollment declined, um, you know uh, lots of concerns. Uh, but one of the big concerns that has been, frankly, a concern for several years is around the use of the, the buildings and uh, how we repurpose those buildings, how we ensure that those buildings do not create blight in our communities. And so um, I wanted to include in this conversation about optimization some of the um, work that has been done 
um, to better position us not to create more blight in our communities. So there are three, <coughs> three or four, but we'll say three um, big strategies for repurposing buildings. You could sell or lease the buildings to someone who wants to utilize them now. Um, you can partner with uh, an entity to redevelop the buildings for housing or for mixed use or for some other um, use that would benefit the community or the area or you might d demolish the building um, depending on where it is and the con condition of the building and the level of interest in doing one of the, the first two sales, uh, lease, or redevelopment. <clears throat> and so um, I'll, I'll come back to, to those in a minute. Um, <coughs> in thinking about um, our capacity as a school district to address this um, issue around repurposing schools, we know and we've stated you know, emphatically previously that uh, we don't necessarily have that capacity or that, that expertise in the house. And so um, we've been challenging ourselves, we've been challenged to think about that and do something about that. And so here are a few strategies for that that um, we believe will absolutely make the difference in how we um, approach this work. One is establishing a facilities repurposing advisory committee. And this committee would be one made up of individuals um, who have some background in redevelopment, some background in real estate, commercial real estate, background in finance um, and, and um, creating some financial packets to help with the um, repurposing of, of, of urban uh, spaces and, and that sort of thing. And so we've already begun developing the um, uh, committee, uh, identifying individuals. We've, um, we've reached out to board members to uh, provide some recommendations. We've gotten some, there are others coming in, and so we're excited to stand this committee up. Um, and this wouldn't necessarily be a, the, the um, um, they wouldn't have the final decision power. Um, in many cases, that would be with the, the board, um, but they would certainly um, be additional capacity and, and um, expertise to uh, make some recommendations that we internally just simply don't have the capacity to do. And so very excited to have and, and very excited by the interest in, of folks who want to be a part of, of this work and help us to think through some opportunities that we have here with the uh, um, district properties. Secondly, to fundraise. Um, uh, fundraise in order to support this repurposing effort in particular. Uh, we've already reached out to um, the Kellogg Foundation uh, for support in uh, helping us with, um, with planning, uh, and they've done some of that already, and with some continued facilitation of the work and planning and um, convening and developing some um, um, chronicling uh, de decision points and um, just supporting this committee really and being the point person for, um, uh, for this work. But fundraising in order to do that. So we've done some private, we've, we've uh, sought some and received already some private funds um, in this vein, but also um, uh, we are seeking some public funding to help um, with some longer term planning and longer term uh, efforts to position these properties, to market the properties, to engage with realtors and, and, and um, developers um, just to help to um, move the work along. The other thing and really important is uh, to hire a professional. We, um, we've gotten some recommendations for um, just rethinking how we as a district operate and even in talking to some of my peers in other places and other districts, um, building out an arm within the district to help to lead that work. But in the, in the short run, um, we want to hire a professional, likely as a consultant, but a professional to work alongside and to help to lead this effort and serve, again, as the point of contact for any developers or um, folks who may want to acquire some of those properties. And so we're 
um, excited to move on that. And in fact, I have a proposal from someone who's done a, a good bit of this work here in Jackson, but as well in, in, um, in other places, in other urban centers. So we're excited that there's been some, mo some movement on that. <coughs> and then lastly, partnering with other entities that specialize in or have an interest in um, some additional capacity around urban development and redevelopment projects. <clears throat> Thankfully, um, we're hearing, and even tonight, we're hearing more and more of uh, other entities, nonprofits, and and um, you know, uh, redevelopment authority, and housing authority, and city planning office, several other entities that do this work all day, every day. Um, and with their expertise and with the, um, the professional uh, assigned to our projects, we do believe that we'll position ourselves in a way that we've not been positioned previously um, to make some smart decisions about properties so that they don't go to waste, so that they're, um, they are returned to the community for uh, the good of the community. Um, and, and hopefully that we're also seeing some financial gain um, where possible with some of these facilities. Um, just quickly, none of this is set in stone. None of this is set in stone, but I, didn't, I wanted to come to you board members and to community with uh, some of the thinking that has already happened around some of the buildings. We know that we want to engage with the, com the committee of experts. We want to um, engage uh, more broadly with community members around some of these buildings where uh, there may be some opportunities for um, community use, but um, we have had lots of conversation and done lots of work around several buildings, and so I wanted to share that with you. So um, the thinking isn't that, you know, there's a blank slate and we're starting from, from, from the ground up. Um, so these are buildings that um, currently uh, we're we're looking at and where there's either been some direct contact, <clears throat> excuse me, contact with us to uh, acquire these buildings, um, or um, we believe they, they very easily could be. And it's Bradley, Brinkley, Barr, Rowan, Sywell, and Watkins for sale and lease. And again, none of this is etched in stone. These are just the you know current uh, considerations for redevelopment um, and especially where there are, are um, entities that do redevelopment projects or because um, a building happens to be in a space where um, some redevelopment is happening uh, or planned um, these are the buildings that immediately come to us uh, again bar bar could be a seller lease or it could be for redevelopment or both um, Brown uh, Enox, George, um, Poindexter. And then lastly, as we think about, um, you know, the condition of buildings, the zoning of uh, buildings in, in the neighborhoods where they sit, um, opportunities to create some green space or, or other um, recreational space, these are the buildings that immediately come to mind. Baker, Dawson, French Rains, and Woodville Heights. Obviously, this, does not, this is not an exhaustive list. This does not include all of the buildings that have been recommended for closure or consolidation, but wanted to give you a sense of the kinds of uh, conversations that have already happened, the entreaties that have been made around these several buildings, um, or the, again, the some of the um, indicators that suggest that one or more of these buildings could be um, demolished to create some space that could be used by the community. Um, I've done a lot of talking, and so I want to pause and see what questions you have, board members. Thank you, Dr. Green. Board members, um, questions, comments? While board members um, prepare, I've got some um, technical questions uh, to, that I want to ask and see if the district has considered these. Uh, the first is around voting precincts. Have we done any analysis on the impact that we are going to have on voting precincts within the city? And if so, 
are we working with the election commission to make sure that this doesn't harm access to the ballot box we have the final we have it we have we do have the list i don't know that we are at a place now where resolution has been created around those i think it would be helpful for us to see that um before we vote as well i can keep going or i can keep okay um so you mentioned um four and a half million roughly in cost savings and that 4.29 yes sir um are we going to, is is this going to pr prompt a reduction in force um if so what does that look like uh it will likely create um or force or, or prompt a reduction in force for a small subset of employees likely for um our school leaders but as it pertains to um teachers and classified team members our team has been crunching numbers to um to determine you know how ready are we to make a declarative uh guarantee but we're very confident that if based on um resignations that we receive on trend annually um retirements that happen um that we uh, trend tend to have each year based on the um vacancies that, that we're carrying right now um and um the number of our team members our teachers in particular who are on um limited service or emergency licensure um we're looking at um uh, we're hopeful that we'll be able to guarantee that our fully certified uh, teachers and those on the teacher contract um, that they will be placed, can be placed in, in a position within the district even after all of the closures and consolidations. Now again, there are those who are on limited service or emergency um, certification and so there may be some challenges there. and. Um, there may actually be some situations where we have more staffing than we need, but we tend to lose staff throughout the year. And so starting the year with, you know, five more elementary teachers, when we lose X number of elementary t teachers throughout the year may not be the worst thing. So we're positioning ourselves and reviewing the, the staffing um, to to make some bold statements about that, but we're not there at this point. Um, with classified staff members, again, given the turnover that we see, given the vacancies that we already have, um, that team is pretty confident that either in a similar uh, uh, position or another position that they could be suited for, that our classified team members would be able to, um, to land um, in a position following any closures or, or consolidations. What well, we can't, the promises that we can't make as yet until we know from school uh, leaders who's retiring, who's planning to leave, um, any promotions that folks may uh, receive. Um, we're just not sure because it's a smaller set of, of people and positions. We're just not sure just yet that um, everyone would um, could be absorbed into the district in, in a current um, assistant principal or principal role. There are other roles that folks could be considered for, and you know that's the work that we do all the time. Um, but that's that's one area where we may um, we we anticipate needing to uh, conduct a reduction in force. So, most likely with principals and assistant principals yes much less likely with other uh employees yeah, far less likely okay and we'll know more as as the year um and and and, a, and you know a finer point on that we have some interim principals right now right who who are not um in a permanent placement so that's a current situation that we we have um we have um, I know of at least one, maybe there, no, I know of at least two principals who have already signaled that they will retire this year. 
so that those numbers were shoring up those numbers of folks who are exiting with the um, people that we have um, to get closer to a one-to-one. -one. And does any optimizing, will that also filter up to central office or positions that are there as well? It will. Okay. It will. Um, board members, questions, comments? Uh, regarding the establishment of a facilities repurposing advisory committee, uh, how much define their input, what, what their job description is? Yes, sir. So um, this is not a this is not a decision making body. This is a it is an advisory body, and it's an <laughs> advisory body with folks who have expertise that most of us in our district don't have. And so um, their role would be as um, fac facilitated and staffed by this professional, the professional that we talked about, the consultant. Um, their role would be to bring potential opportunities to the table to discuss, to, um, to help to stamp and, and solidify any criteria used for perhaps making a decision for demolishing or for um, selling something. Um, there are, thankfully, there are more and more entities that are um, showing some interest in buildings. At some point, we'll likely have more interest, you know, a, a couple of, of entities or more than one entity looking for a particular building. Someone will determine or make a recommendation to the board around you know, what, what to do with that building. Should it go here for this purpose? Should it go here for this purpose? That um, advisory committee will help to make those recommendations. Um, and and um, we need this advisory committee to help to um, help to make sense some of the, the challenges. Someone may want, or an, an entity might want a building, but doesn't necessarily know how to get the financing to do the work that needs to happen in the, happen in the building or something like that. I'm making this up, but these are the kinds of things that we would hope that the advisory committee would help to um, explore and support and advise on opportunities that sit outside of our expertise and our networks outside of that to help to bring additional resources to us. And, and uh, what, what might their time constraints be? Uh, How much time would we be expecting them to? Yes. I, I honestly don't know, but it is an advisory committee, so um, um, you know, I can't imagine that uh, even if they were to meet weekly or every other week, that it would be, you know, an hour and a half, two hours, something like that. Something like the board's time, <laughs> investment of time, something like that. Maybe not as much, but something like that. And, and just so for my hearing, uh, would you restate who they will report to? Oh, um, I, I didn't state, but they're advising the district. And so their advice will come to me and to the board. Ultimately, I, I would imagine you still want the superintendent to bring recommendations to the board. Um, but again, you know, we need help. We need assistance. The, the, the professional would be staffing the committee would be providing um, support for any documents that they need, any additional information or scheduling meetings or um, doing walkthroughs of buildings or that sort of thing. Um, and, and then the um, advisory committee would be considering all of these things and, and providing some, some guidance. I don't know that I fully answered the question, but I, they don't, the, the, we haven't really considered them as reporting to anyone. They report to, or except to the district. That, 
the that the professional is the consultant that we will hire. Yes. They will report to me. Would these individuals be from oh I'm sorry. That's Jean. It's Jean. No, you go on to tell you. She said go on to tell you. Okay. Uh will these individuals come from the immediate area, Jackson or are you um, we, we, I've not really contemplated folks from outside of the area just because, mm -hmm. um, you know, just because it's, we want folks to be able to see our properties, to convene with us and that sort of thing. I'm, I don't know that I'm close to it, but, but it would be difficult to manage and to have to, to have to have, um, the teleconference facilities set up for conversations and that sort of thing. And Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. With all due respect to the board and to everyone in the room. Excuse me, sir. Uh, we, we had public comment earlier, and we got to keep this going. I'm sorry. I was called uh, directly by Mr. Mayor, and he, 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 uh, and he told me the meeting was canceled. I was, I've been here since five. So I'm sorry, sir. We, we, we got a protocol that we got to follow. And if, 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 yeah, if you want to catch us after the meeting, I'm sure we will, the board will be open to hearing what you have to say. Um, for the, we, we got to get through our meeting, though. But, but we, will, we will be here at the end of the meeting. And so that's the way we got to go. And, and and I would I would hope that you would you would stay for the rest of the conversation. Doctor Green. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Doctor Sivat, if uh, board members have uh, individuals that we think would be good um, persons to be on the advisory committee, should we just share those names with you? Yes, ma'am. Please do. Okay. Yes. I, I can just email them to you or maybe call you? E yes, email them if you would. Email. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Yes, ma'am. Other questions, comments? Um, I have some questions around um, regarding a lot of the feedback, and I, I didn't hear you address it. A lot of the feedback that we received in the community, a lot of the meetings we were in, I, I keep hearing rivalry, rivalry, rivalry. And I keep hearing the meshing of two high schools and what that's going to do for communities. And so I would like to know what kinds of things um, are you having in place or would have in place to address those things. Also. Um, I'm also hearing that, and I don't know, I'm asking now, mm -hmm. if there has been an increase in fighting at um, Witten and Peoples with students, since they are in the same building as middle school students. I don't know if they, you know that answer now or not, but I'm just raising that up. I will ask the team for data, but I don't, I don't know that there's been an increase. We do have fights in schools. Every school, not every, all of the high schools for sure, and I believe all of our middle schools, we do have fights. Is there an increase? I, I don't know that there's an increase, but I will, I will get some data just to, so that I'm, I'm not speaking out of turn on that. Uh, with regard to, and, and, and I don't know that this was exactly your question, but I'll, I'll also look to see if, any of any fights there at the people's building are between um, Witten scholars and people scholars. Mm -hmm. I think that's at the core of your question, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes, we'll 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 um, gather that information. Um, with regard to the the rivalries in that, um, we we have we've heard a, a bit about um, and what I called it was what I named was state safety issues. Um, but rivalries um, between scholars from this neighborhood and that neighborhood or these neighborhoods and those neighborhoods. Um, as much as I hate the reaction of more policing, um, we'll absolutely have increased uh, safety um, officers and, and guards in, in the schools, largely because of the numbers. 
<coughs> you know, much as we do with um, with Murrah High School, they've got more staffing because of the numbers of scholars there in the building. So um, that's one thing. Um, We'll, we'll need to look again at the uh, some of the the technology that we utilize, the cameras, the the um, metal detectors, and that sort of thing, just to make sure that we've got enough to for the increased numbers there. Um, as well, we I don't I don't know who knows how many people know this. We do actually quite a bit of work um, around uh, addressing individual scholars' needs around emotions and um, you know not all of the things that uh, not all of the conflict that happens in school is really about that other young person in school or that adult in school um, often enough it's about something that they're dealing with in their personal lives or in their homes and so um, continued work to um, case manage and address individual scholars needs and not assume that everybody who's now in this space together has some challenge or conflict with everybody else. It's just not the truth. Um, we, we have had some entreaties, some initial conversations with, the, um, with JPD, just to hear more about what they are seeing and what they know about, um, about any potential gangs or groups or neighborhood beefs and that sort of thing. So to the extent that, that that can better inform and help us to be more proactive on the front end, absolutely. We don't claim to have all those those answers, but um, but those are some of the responses. Um, and there may be other uh, specific strategies that folks are working through that I'm just not aware of at this point um, at, the, at the building level, um, but those are some of the, the ones. Another question I have is um, around, I guess, I, uh, it, if we're talking about merging the school or consolidation of schools and even looking futuristic for Jackson and the possibility of merging more, even high schools and maybe I don't know, looking at just say for instance, for if we have just this one school in, in South Jackson that we rename the entire school, the one name that that's not either school. So neither school has the, the, the claim to say, y'all moved into our building. You know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. one University of South Jackson High School <laughs> and we get rid of if, if that makes sense, I don't know if it makes sense to anybody, but to it say there is no Forest Hill, there is no Wingfield anymore. There is only South Jackson uh, Academy or South Jackson, whatever that is, for the entire area. And I don't know if that's a consideration. <clears throat> it is absolutely a consideration. Um, we've not gone far with it. Um, I don't. I don't want to get folks spun up about, you know, something know that, that, that. That steps on a lot of other toes, I know, but it, I'm but, just. <laughs> but, but there's an opportunity there. And, and, I mean, you hinted at it. There's an opportunity there for a new identity that, um, that everyone can get behind and, um, and one that we're absolutely absolutely considering I mean we even earlier today we've been talking through some of the if something like that were to happen you know what are the what are the facilities changes that would be needed new signage there's some floors with uh, decals and logos on them um, and walls and all that sort of thing uh, there's a there's a um, there's several tentacles to a decision like that that we'd have to kind of work through but it's absolutely one and, and to the extent that something like that could help to take off some of release some of the steam from this um, I, yes ma'am so more on that I I, 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 I want to work with the schools with the school leadership before um, going too far with that but to the extent that there's any opportunity for that to not be another 
you know, point of contention, but but something that's seen as a really good thing and a unifying opportunity. I, I'd love to do that. And also identifying um, more opportunities for the merger of a school, like for even the sports arena, and, and, and highlighting and sharing that for students, like playing in a, another level of, of with sports or I don't know. I, 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 mm -hmm. to basically help everybody understand what are some of the benefits other than just <coughs> this um, merger for uh, our financial kind of thing. What other benefits can happen from something like that for students being in a larger building um, or more students being there to get more funding in that building to help what what are we bringing? What are we giving them more of? And so I'd like to see that shown, or the community be able to see yeah. what kind of what what that brings up for them. So um, that I I understand the the desire to see more of that, and I understand the push for that. I want to remind the board that we're in the year five of our strategic plan, and there's you know we really don't want to do much of that before this happens or doesn't happen. But there's a lot around like what this school, what our high schools, what high school programming, what athletics, <coughs> on and on and on, what that could and should be that, you know, our past practice as we built this plan and certainly as we build the next one that we want to engage community around. It's like the which comes first, chicken or the, or the egg. Are these two schools or is this one school? Or do we have these larger schools and these tiny schools? You know, because the, the the programming and offerings are very different in those two scenarios. And so, yes, and, um, you know, there's an opportunity for us in our next strategic plan to be really clear on the things that are non-negotiables in Jackson Public Schools, no matter what high school you attend, right. no matter what elementary school you attend. Um, and and, and I, I understand, I absolutely understand the desire to know it all now. Getting to this point has been a lot of work. Yeah, I, I have some, I have some just disjointed questions, and so I'm just going to kind of fire, fire through a list um, as, as best I can. One of the things that you that you mentioned. And this kind of piggybacks, I'm starting here for a reason, piggybacking off of uh, what Ms. Thompson was just saying. It's talking about um, one of the benefits is robust planning and flexibility in the uh, robust educational planning and programming um, and flexibility in the budget on that front. Can you, can you talk at all about um, any of the specifics about um, programming growth that we're targeting for any of the schools? That are sticking around for I can think of one in particular, and I'll just I'll just name it, and then we can you can tell me if there are others. I mean, one is that I know we heard at community meetings, and it was incredibly encouraging, is the growth of the art program at Green, um, with an idea, with a mind toward maybe mirroring what we see at Casey, which has been extraordinarily successful. Um, and so I'm just wondering if there are other specifics that we've already looked into. Um, and if you could, just kind of shed light on that. Yeah. Uh, so absolutely the arts programming, and, and I'm thankful that we've got such a strong arts community and, and interest in the arts. Too. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I am. Um, and, and we want to feed that. And so uh, that, and that wasn't my idea. I believe it actually kind of came up from the school, the school community. So we're doubly excited about that, that they're – um, that they wanted to take that on. Um, as you know, I believe you know, we've got a growing um, um, EL um, population, uh, English language learners uh, population, and um, and we have, I believe we're in the second year, I believe second year of a, a seal of biliteracy, uh, an opportunity through the state where if you if you achieve at a certain level of language uh, learning, um, two, la two languages, um, you have an opportunity to get a seal on your high school diploma. 
And so those realities kind of converging, one of the things that I've been um, promoting and, and hopeful without demanding it, but hopeful through our, our um, strategic planning process will, will come out is the development of stronger language development. There's lots of, lots of research that says that learning a second language helps you in your first language, helps you to develop um, stronger skills in, in your first. Um, and so um, that as one, and so thinking about the patterns, um, the feeder pattern and placement of those kinds of programs, but you know, how do we do that and how do we support the staffing for it? Where are the teachers <laughs> that teach these foreign languages and how do we develop them and keep them and all the things? Um, so that's one. There's been lots of conversation around our athletic programs and not just the current athletic um, the, uh, offerings, but, but you know, more and, and further expanding on some of those that we have um, and, and some commitments even to facilities to um, ensure that our scholars have uh, opportunities to develop in more of those, swimming being one. Um, but as I think about it, tennis is, is another. Um, and I know that um, our soccer friends probably feel all kinds of disrespected because of the lack of facilities that they have. And so, you know, th those are some um, across kind of that, that spectrum that we'd like to see. Um, the, uh, I'm pleased at the growth of our, our bands, our marching bands and, and um, concert bands, well, more so marching bands, but even um, the jazz bands and now the choirs and the men's chorales and all of that, that's those um, programs that are expanding. And so um, as we have more of that, of course, with staffing, but also with entry fees to competitions and traveling the, here and there to do that, there's Plus investments that we have to make in order to have these experiences mean what they could mean and what they do mean in other places. So those are some of the ones that immediately come to mind. But I, I'd imagine there are other academic programs like STEM, STEAM, mm -hmm. um, uh, that, that are already in motion and we've just got to figure out what's, what's going to be the, the stake in the ground that we have. Um, we'll, we run lots of programs, small programs. Some are pilots that have been going on for many years. Are they still a pilot? But they, they, you know, they exist in a fledgling, fledgling way. And so looking for ways to expand on those. Um, so I was hoping uh, that you could, you could talk a little bit about the kind of what prompted the change um, in, in terms of um, the rezoning for Chastain in particular. Um, the, the original proposal, I know you'll remember, but just for everybody's benefit, yeah. relocated the majority of those scholars over to, over to Bailey, um, like you pointed out. And, and so we've sort of opted into um, w working them into where I absolutely believe we have capacity, and so I don't doubt you there, into Kirksey and Powell. And, uh, it, so just it, talk to me about that. Yeah, it, it was a capacity issue on the other side. Um, operating essentially two programs in Bailey with the added fourth and fifth grade, um, we simply don't have the space in the building to operate two, essentially two programs there. Um, and so uh, we went to plan B. Unfortunately, the Bailey Knights won't get to be city champions uh, when, they, when they start. <laughs> uh, uh, I, uh, I, I, one of the things that I've that I've asked um, that I've asked a couple of times is just um, where where are we in the planning process and, and and how confident are we in the implementation for building playgrounds at the buildings where they're now going to be necessary. I'm thinking of Witten in particular. I'm thinking also of the 2025 shifts where you'll that would include Bailey oh, and sorry. and uh, Northwest. Um, we've got a lot of relocation of elementary students into formerly not elementary buildings. And so I'm just wondering where we are with that. Yes, sir. Um, we have, I believe we now have t t two or three um, proposals from um, groups that um, we're asking to help us with managing these projects. 
the specifically the projects for so there's all these projects happening but specifically the projects related to um, optimization so um, more scholars are coming here how do we ensure that the classrooms are what they need to be for younger scholars that there's um, uh, playgrounds for the younger scholars that there's whatever needs to be yeah. um, and so we've got um, some proposals already um, I'm hopeful that before we leave for winter break um, proposals for professional support around project management I'm hopeful that before we leave for winter break that the um, entity that will be helping us to do that work will be identified and um, we've got some marching orders with uh, well and we'll know exactly you know um, where we're going what you need <laughs> yeah um, but but that's another opportunity for us and you know we've got the limited tax um, no dollars that we're excited to have that opportunity to utilize some of that to uh, address some of those needs but um, with the help of those professionals we can get more quickly to those projects and have them ready for those that need to be ready for um, this fall and for a couple of those schools that will um, be moving in in fall 25 would be moving in fall 25 um, there were a couple of just pieces of information I'm going to I'm going to request because I have very little doubt that you're not going to have them sitting in front of you. Um, <clears throat> when we talk about the estimated operational cost avoidance, um, if you could uh, let me know what that we haven't we have the number as it sits in the in the current proposal. I don't recall what the number was originally, and so I'm just wondering what the what the, the drop was. The that annual makes was 11, I thought. 11.3 that I underestimated you all <laughs> um, Oops. and then the second um, is the uh, estimated renovation costs for key green and Clausel that were originally included on the list but I'm just wondering what we're what we're deciding to keep right that that, that is a those are buildings that if we're going to keep um, and 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 invest in reasons that why that you outline for keeping them are wonderful reasons and 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 the vast majority of those reasons came from community feedback. Um, I heard them specifically at a number of those meetings and um, and so I, I just I do want to lift that up and I want to thank the people who came to those meetings to 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 tell us things that that whether we knew them or not we maybe we weren't thinking of them properly we weren't giving them enough weight um, uh, those meetings had real significant uh, meaningful impact on what we're considering right now um, and so I, but I would like to know uh, what the estimated renovation costs are for those buildings that we're keeping on hand um, just so just so we're sort of clear out about it yes sir um, so uh, just a request for that um, and and maybe the, I think the last thing for me um, I never want to promise that that's a that's that's a mistake if you ever believe that from any lawyer that's a mistake um, it could could you pull back up the the slide on the Jim Hill feeder pattern um, I, I missed this and was meaning to look when you were talking and did a bad job. Okay, so all when we when we're looking on the right, that needs revision. Yes. Yes. Okay. All right. I was just making sure. Apologies. I wasn't. I was just making sure I wasn't um, that I I wasn't misunderstanding sort of our our use on that. Um, yes. Uh, yes. Clause L is is. And so. As I promised, I, I lied. Uh, can, can you back up also to the to the to the sort of new list of the closure consolidation list? Um, just for clarity, I I, I want to kind of um, maybe point out one thing: the that Witten Middle School will the Witten building will still be in use. Yes. Um, so that's. That's, that is one that while the middle school is the middle school students who left this year are not returning to that building, we still intend to make use of that building. That's yes. surely in sight. Okay. Yes, sir. And, uh, that's, and that's why we uh, yep. 
that's why we don't have it listed. Yeah, no, I got you. Yeah. Um, I'm just trying to keep yeah. everything straight in my head. Yeah. Um, and the and the last uh, a, a related point, the Wells APAC building um, is is not slated for closure. It will still be used as the performing arts center, but yes. not for academic education. Correct. Yes, sir. Okay. Correct. And that's why, because I think we had that listed as well. We yep. took that off because. Yep. Yeah, you know, we will be using the building, and so we've got to continue to invest in the building for <coughs> scholars and team members. Um, I promised that those would be disjointed questions, and I think I honored that promise at least. So, uh, thank you, Dr. Green. No worries. More members, other questions? If not, I'll invite closing comments. Closing comments. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I so, knew you had something to say. <laughs> thank you, sir. Uh, so I just wanted to, uh, Mr. President, reassure the superintendent and this capable administration that what we are dealing with at this moment has absolutely nothing to do with the students, the teachers of previous administrations. In the 1800s, Mississippi chose to operate two school districts separate and apart from each other. And they did that until the United States Supreme Court intervened in 1954. But rather than acquiesce to the Supreme Court's recommendation, Mississippi as a state chose to fight it and resist it. And it wasn't until Ms. Hilliard, the early to mid-1970s that the state of Mississippi decided to take two separate school districts here in Jackson and elsewhere about the state and make one. Now, the federal government, before 1954, made enormous amounts of money available <coughs> to the state of Mississippi to rectify that situation, these two separate and unequal school districts to bring it up. But Mississippi chose to use that money to make council schools after Citizens Council, private schools, academies. And so they just squandered the money. And today, because of that fierce fight for over 20 years, when they did bring, I believe it was over Christmas break, mm. People went home in December to a separate school system and came back in January to a unified school system. No teacher professional development, no nothing. Just made the name unitary one school district. Nothing else was done. And tonight, December the 5th, 2023, we sit here 
and have to try to make sense of what the state of Mississippi has done to public education here in Jackson and elsewhere about the state. We're not the only district dealing with that. But we got to make. And so I applaud this superintendent and this board for trying to clean up a mess that the state made. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Fagers. Dr. Green, um, a couple, two things. First, um, Ms. Tom Mrs. Thompson brought up naming uh, high schools in South Jackson. I really want to, um, should this go forward, challenge you and your team to make sure we don't lose the names that we should not lose. Yes, sir. There were previous boards that did a lot of work to make sure there were names in, in, on buildings that our children, our students could learn about, recognize, know that represent them. We need every building in our district to be representative of our student body. And so let's not lose those important names in this process. For example, Shirley was one of those names. We, we can't do that. Great. Speaking of history, um, I have great concerns about the empty buildings. Um, these, it was brought up earlier in public comment, and I, I have to say what was described is true. We have to own that as a board, as an administration. Um, we, we don't have any models to point to where we've gotten that right. Not since I've been on the board, not since you've been here. So I, I do a pre, well, my fear, this is my fear, is that if we pass this proposal, We'll take a deep breath. It's, this has not been an easy ride for community, you know, for you, for the board, but particularly for community, for the students, the parents, for the teachers. Um, but my fear is that we'll take a deep breath and fall back into the routine should we pass this and go about educating. It's what you do. It's what you know. It's what you all know. It's what you're good at. Um, and it's not on purpose, but it's, it's, it's bureaucracy, it's government. It, and so if we move forward with this, I'm putting a lot of stock in this advisory committee. It needs to be more than just advisory. It needs to be oriented towards a plan. It needs to be, the goals need to be specific. We need to be able to take the plan and go advocate for federal resources to repurpose for the things that the city needs, whether it's affordable housing or, or after school or, uh, you know, name the, name the program. Um, I'm hopeful that we can pretty quickly get after some of the things. We've got resources. We, we, we just closed or we will close on a limited tax note, so we will have some resources. Um, but we, if this goes forward, to, all the things you said about focusing on students is, is, is true, that's, and that's what you're so good at. Um, and I just want us not to lose sight that our responsibility doesn't stop at the school building wall. We are in community, of community. The only reason we're here is because the community stood up when, at our darkest hour. And so... Um, you know, I just don't, so, so the advisory committee has got, has got to work. It's got to be oriented towards the plan. We've got to take it serious. We've got to, we've got to be committed to it. Um, we've got to show up and, and listen and get the right people in place. Um, and so that's, that's my comment, um, is, is, um, is that we, we don't just 
get on the other side if 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 it if it does come to pass and 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 just say and the other thing you know i've heard that this will take a long time i've heard numbers as long as a decade that it will take a decade to redevelop this number of properties we can't use that as an excuse to not act with urgency around the buildings i think the hiring of an outside expert is critical we got to get the right person I think you're on the right track with that um, and so but that is to me it, it is something we, we got to make sure we get right so. okay I've got I've got one last um, just comment um, and it's something that I've touched on in this space before um, and I, I just I just want to take a take half a beat to say it. Um, one of my deep concerns as we've gone through this whole process is that, um, is that we're going to find ourselves back in the need to do this again on some level, probably not on this level, but on some level again. And like Ms. Thompson actually said, um, particularly at the high school level. And I know how hard that has been. Um, one of the things that was shared with, with the board um, and, and is, is the full capacity of all of our high schools and <coughs> including the target enrollments for those high schools. And um, I have fear that they're already low. As we've outlined them right now, um, I have some fear about that. Um, and, and sort of what that means we're going to be doing. Um, so I, I really do applaud um, the amount of thought and work that went into this. Um, but I just, I, I don't know. I mean, that, that's the one part of this that feels very unsettled for me. Um, at the same time, I don't know that I have the stomach uh, to sit through um, more than what we heard from the, the students at Wingfield High, mm -hmm. um, more than anybody else. Mm -hmm. um, there were plenty of people that, that voiced concerns over that, plenty of community members that had really valid reasons, that had deep connections to that place. <clears throat> None of them, they all paled in comparison to what we heard from those kids. Um, and um, it feels in some ways hollow um, to say this, but I'm going to say it anyway because it's true, and that is that those kids should feel really proud of themselves for their ability to speak up for themselves. Um, so uh, I just, I just want to lift that up um, and and not to be a downer, but it, it's just um, it's one of those things that, that I see and, and, and worry about even in the plan that we're considering today. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I mean, as we look toward um, working to make sure we get kids, you know, that we're that we're selling how great we are um, so that we get kids back here away from not great competitors and we have a lot of not great competitors within Jackson and just on the periphery of Jackson and um, and so I think part of this plan has to be um, really working hard to get kids back to reverse some of this trend um, in the same way as that I've heard um, I've heard adult friendship described as as a uh, as a constant, constantly selling your friends to move where you are, uh, and just to, just to relocate to where you are so we can hang out more, um, we should be doing that. We should be doing that. Um, so um, that's my last thought. I, I do. Um, yeah, I wanted to make that point about the Wingfield Scholars in particular. They were um, heartbreaking and incredible. Um, in those public meetings. I just want to add, since he brought it up, um, just as my position here on the board and representing Ward 6 in South Jackson, um, 
it has went un underrepresented for a number of years before um, even as all the whole time my children were matriculating through JPS schools, South Jackson, Wingfield in particular was not being represented. I just want to publicly say that and let it be on the record that I know it, I recognize it, and I see it, and I have felt it um, for a number of years before ever I sat in the seat. And I just hate that we have um, got to this place to where it's almost as though it's just, it's just like t it's too late to do anything with it except what we need to do. And if we are going to do that, then the only way I can see of uh, <laughs> right-sizing it to make it be fair is for the entire South Jackson to, to come together under, you know, one roof, one umbrella, one name, one color, one, you know, whatever that's going to be, and that it, we be represented here at this table and in this district. Um, and I say that because the prior representation board member that was representing War 6 wasn't even a member, wasn't even, wasn't even um, living in South Jackson or living in the ward, and that's what the reason for the resignation. I'm just taking it all the way back. And then there was a number of years that we didn't have anybody at the table. Then we got somebody, when they reseated everybody, she stayed a year. And then she was gone. And then for another two years almost, there was no one here. And I kept asking and asking and asking. That's the only reason I think I am at the table. I think about my bishop who says it is the squeaky uh, wheel that gets the oil. And I kept asking and kept asking, who is representing Ward 6? Who is representing uh, South Jackson? Who is the person at the table? Now that gets to be me in such a time as this when a, a great majority of these schools fall in the South Jackson community. And it uh, feels somewhat unfair. I just have to say it, it just feels unfair. Um, and. And I know it's not the district, because I understand the, the moving of the people, in the, and, I, and I know the people moving out, because we got the empty houses in our communities. I know they're there. I know that the people have moved on, and I know that there are other uh, charters that have come up to allow the schools, to students to have choice to go wherever they're going, so we've lost money there. So I know that. I know we've lost businesses in South Jackson. Um, I know that, you know, bridges have been out that have com I mean, completely closed down entire streets, uh, communities where the whole, all the businesses have closed down. And so, yeah, the schools are there. So I, I'm just saying I know that, I recognize it, I see it. All I'm saying is I'm agreeing with Dr. Seatback that now that we're here and should we make this decision, let's make it in such a way that it is not the same old, that we don't breathe and go back to doing the same old, same old, that we actually take this opportunity to rise above anything that we've ever seen, reimagine what this can look like for our students and our scholars in the South Jackson community. It needs to be reimagined to a level that makes people want to move back to our community and move back to those schools and be even bust and say, I want to go to that academy, that University of South Jackson School because of the programming or whatever it is that they have that is just so amazing. Just like we have people that want to go to Murrah because of APAC or you know these other places. That this offerings here are, uh, Special, exactly, special for everybody. Not just the high academic, but for even the student that needs to learn farming and agriculture and how to raise chickens like they did at Wingfield or uh, <laughs> those other things that they need. To, so, because we need that too in our communities. So, um, whatever that looks like, I just want to make it be known that we, South Jackson's here. Y'all have a voice at the table, and I, I hear you, I feel you, and I want to be able to make the best decisions for us 
at this table while we're here. So that's what I have to say to close out. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Thompson. Board members, I think we can close with that, unless there's anything else. Dr. Green, thank you. Okay. Um, next. If these three things aren't awarded to you, the revised job descriptions for director of library services and manager of the teacher resource center, Dr. Kimberly Smith, our executive director of the Office of Teaching and Learning, will present this information. Good evening. Good evening. To our Good. board, President Cvet, Dr. Green, our JPS community, the administration <coughs> is recommending that the Board of Trustees approve the revisions of the job descriptions for the director for library services and manager of the teacher resource, resource center roles. Um, you should have a copy of those um, adjustments in your packet. The purpose of the director of library services is to, is to support school librarians and planning, directing, and overseeing the activities and operations of the school libraries in Jackson Public Schools and supervise the manager of the Teacher Resource Center. The revised job description will remove direct supervision of Teacher Resource Center from the director of library services, giving him or her more opportunity to directly work with our school librarians and also shift um, the manager role from the hourly pay schedule to the administrative pay schedule to reflect the enhanced responsibilities of the position, which is also, also provides oversight of part-time staff as well. Thank you, Dr. Smith. Board members, any comments or questions? Thank you. Next, we will move on to the review of the amended agreement between the University of Phoenix and the Jackson Public School District. Ms. Lyons, our Executive Director of Human Resources, will present this information on behalf of Dr. Tommy Knowles, our Director of Recruitment. Ms. Lyons. Good evening. Dr. Green, uh, Board President CVAC, members of the board. The administration is presenting for information only the agreement between the University of Phoenix and Jackson Public School District to provide clinical experience through student teaching, internship opportunities in the Jackson Public School District. The update to the agreement is to inform the board that the University of Phoenix has been newly acquired by third party, 4-3 Education, Inc. The current agreement will continue to be used to provide the University of Phoenix opportunity to allow student teachers to hand on teaching, learning, and uh, practical classroom and virtual experiences with a district teacher. There have been no changes to the structure of the current agreement regarding student teaching and internship opportunities. Thank you, Ms. Lyons. Board members, are there any questions or comments? Thank you. Next, board members, we will move on to our information action items. The first is the request to approve the Mississippi Employer Assisted Housing Teacher Program Loan Agreement. Uh, Ms. Lyons will present this information. Uh, Dr. Green, Board President CVAC, members of the board, the loan agreement before you is between the Mississippi Department of Education in conjunction with Fannie Mae and the teacher listed in board material. A maximum loan amount up to $6,000 is available to an eligible teacher to assist in paying the closing costs of the home, and the teacher must agree to render three years of service to the district. Based on this information, the Office of Human Resources is recommending approval of the Mississippi Employer Assisted Housing Teacher Program Loan Agreement for a teacher at Provine High School. Thank you, Ms. Lyons. Board members, any questions or comments? Ms. Lyons, this is a $6,000 basically down payment 6, assistance. Okay. Yes, up to $6,000, yes, sir. Okay, thank you. Uh, board members, I'm going to hold the vote on this one until Mrs. Thompson comes back. Um, Thank you, Ms. Lyons. I'll invite Attorney Harris to come up to present the next uh, item, which is the request to approve the student blanket professional liability insurance. Um, Attorney Harris. Good evening, board members, board president, Dr. Sivak, Dr. Green, community. The Office of the General Counsel and Risk Management is recommending that the board approve to bind the insurance with um, coverage with Mercer Consumer. This is our annual annual renewal for the Student Blanket Professional Liability Program at Lanier High School. Thank the you. amount of the insurance cost is $213 and it covers up to $1 million for each incident or $3 million in the aggregate. Thank you, Attorney Harris. Board members, any questions or comments? 
Joint Harris, this is for the Allied Health Program, the, the students where for they the got the health services the, program. Yes, with the mannequins they, and the and yes, the, they take health sciences health one and two, and then an EMT class. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, next, we'll move on to the request to approve the Legacy Scholars Grant with the Equal Justice Initiative in Jackson Public Schools. Attorney Harris. The Office of the General Counsel is recommending that the Jackson Public School District Board of Trustees approve the grant agreement between the Equal Justice Initiative and the Jackson Public School District on behalf of Lanier High School. Um, Lanier High School applied for and was awarded the Legacy Scholars Grant for 100 scholars and 10 chaperones to visit the Legacy M Museum from in from slavery to mass incarceration in Montgomery, Alabama. They'll be attending on December the 20th, 2023, and the amount of this grant award is $8,800. Thank you, Attorney Harris. Board members, any questions or comments? I, I had just a quick question. What's the selection process for the kids that go? Do we know? They all no, go. I don't know. They all go. Right, it's open to everyone. I think that it's open for whichever student Whoever wants to sign up, up and, and go, uh, and then right. once they gain the interest, they apply for the grant award. Perfect. That's that's what I was wondering if it was open to anybody or if there was some sort of criteria. I think it's open in several different classes. Go the class that presented to you all was a class mm -hmm. from the CDC um, early childhood behavior class. So um, mm -hmm. it's open for all of our scholars to have the experience at all of our high schools. Fantastic. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you, Attorney Harris. Um, next is the request to approve the agreement between Jackson State University and the Jackson Public School District for a mental health service professional grant project. Um, Ms. Amanda Thomas, our Executive Director of Climate and Wellness, will present this information. Good evening, Dr. Sivak, board members, Dr. Green, community <coughs> members. Um, the administration presents to you a recommendation of a, to approve the purpose of the agreement um, between Jackson Public Schools and Jackson State University. The purpose of this agreement is to establish a guiding working relationship between Jackson State University's Department of Counseling, Rehabilitation and Psychometric Services, College of Education and Human Development, and Jackson Public Schools District. Um, essentially, the Mental Health Service Professional Grant will create a pipeline of mental health service providers with Jackson State University. The partnership will allow the placement of graduate students in school-based mental health services fields in Jackson Public Schools for the purpose of completing required field work, credit hours, internships, or related training necessary to complete or obtain their degree. The grant will also cover the cost of tuition, provide a modest salary for these students, as well as provide equipment, training opportunities, and support to the graduate students, as well as the project director. Um, Dr. Williams, who will serve, serve as the project director, um, has been in communication with Dr. Porter at Jackson State as well as the staff, and she will um, be working alongside them to ensure successful implementation of this grant. Thank you, Ms. Thomas. Board members, any questions, comments? Thank you, Ms. Thomas. Next, we'll invite uh, Dr. William Merritt, our Chief of Staff, uh, who will present the request to approve the grant agreement between the Mississippi Arts Commission and the Jackson Public School District at Casey Elementary School. Great Dr. evening, Board, Dr. Sevak, Board members, Dr. Green, and JPS community. Uh, the recommended action is that um, to uh, approve this grant that allows the school to continue to provide arts integrated instruction to scholars at Casey Elementary. And the arts integration ins instruction will include dance and theater teaching. Thank you, Dr. Mayor. Board members, any questions or comments? Hearing none, we will move on to item F, uh, the request to approve the agreement between the Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority and the Jackson Public School District for the Childhood Hunger Initiative Power Pack Program. Dr. Merritt. The administration recommends the review of the following project agreement with the Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated as outlined below. Through this agreement, Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated will offer the Childhood Hunger Initiative Power Pack, or as known as CHIP program. The program is designed to offer a supply of meals and snacks free of charge for students enrolled at a JPS elementary school for the weekends and or extended breaks. Uh, as named in the MOU, the schools are Oak Forest and Leicester Elementary. Each week, a bag of non-perishable food items will be delivered to the school containing food for two breakfasts, two lunches, two snacks, and one can of vegetables and one can of fruit for each participating scholar. Specific items may vary based on uh, parent and scholar feedback. However, all items are designed for optimal nutrition. 
Thank you, Dr. Mayor. Board members, any questions or comments? Hearing none, I'll take up a vote on items A through F. Um, is there a motion to approve our information action items A through F? I so move. Second. Ms. Hilliard has moved. Mr. McGuffey has seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 And nays, the motion carries. Next, we have the request to approve our monthly financial report for the month ended October 31st, 2023. Uh, Mr. Earl Burke, our Chief Operations Officer, will run, run us through the financials. Good evening, President Seaback, board members, Dr. Green, audience. The administration recommends that the board approve the monthly financial report for the month ending October 31st, 2023. Um, the preliminary monthly finance report contains a statement of fund balance, budget status report, the bank reconciliation report, and the district maintenance cash flow report. Highlights of that report are as follows. From the statement of fund balance, referencing page four of your report, um, for general funds, the 1000, and this is the 1000 through the 1999 funds, our beginning 24 fund balance <coughs> as of June 30th was 22,784,773. Uh, this in comparison to our 2023 fund balance, which was $21.9 million. Uh, this represents an increase of about $871,000 or 3.98% increase in fund balance over last year. Referencing page 7, FY fund balance, uh, 24 fund balance as of October 31st was $5 million uh, as compared to $3.6 million. Uh, in our last October, last year's October position. Expenditures exceed revenues right now by approximately, uh, as of October 31st, by about $17.8 million. Uh, just one note, 16 section revenues, we have collected, uh, had collected through October 31st, about 27% of what we budgeted uh, in terms of uh, 16 section revenue collections. Special revenue fund uh, section, the fund balance in child nutrition uh, continues to uh, be to stay about level. It's about $12.1 million. Uh, we are making some investments in uh, cafeteria expenditures. We've spent about 800000 on new furniture and equipment that's being installed, and we continue uh, to, to move forward. We're refreshing our cafeterias. Title uh, funds, these are um, also special revenue funds. You know, it's titled the combined fund balance in uh, those federal funds. Federal funds was a $10.9 million negative. We have pending drawdowns of $9 million as of November 12th. So there's about a $1.9 million float there. We again continue to close the gap between um, the expenditure of those funds and us getting those drawdowns uh, returned to the district. But the status report section of their fund balance report, I mean, the budget status section of your monthly report, district maintenance funds, 1120. Our anticipated revenues for this year was $200 million. All other funds were $283.9 million for a total of $484 million for total anticipated revenues. Year to date collected, um, just in district maintenance, 347 all other funds 31.9 which is about 66.6 .6 million revenues collected this is about 13.7 percent of what we uh, budgeted expenditure wise we budgeted 200.7 million in district maintenance and across our other funds to 266.7 million for its combined total expenditure budget of 467 million we've expended uh, to 1131 52.5 million in, in district maintenance and 55.2 million in all across all of our other funds for a total of 107.7 million. That's about 23% of our budgeted expenditures. Bank reconciliations as of September 30th, uh, referencing page 26 through 28. All district bank accounts are with uh, board approved depositories. Bank statements have been <coughs> reconciled appropriately and promptly. Cash flow, district maintenance, 1120. As of October 31st, the ending cash balance was 2.3 million compared to October 22 balance of 1.8. This represents about a 32.5% increase from prior uh, year's position. 
And then other key performance indicators, headlines for October 31st, overall revenues collected year to date was about 2.2 million uh, less than last year. Uh, overall expenditures 2.3 uh, or 5% greater than last year. Avalon collections are 1.3 million less than last year. And then personnel benefits year to date about $311,000 more than last year. And that is your financial report. I will entertain any questions, comments, criticisms, and or wanderings. wanderings. Thank you, Mr. Burke. Board members, any questions, comments? Uh, Mr. Burke, um, one of the first things uh, in part of your report, uh, you mentioned that um, the fund balance uh, was about $3.6 million lower from FY22's October position is is that's is is that largely a function of timing of payments? Yes, sir. Okay. Just that June thirtieth is really the snapshot for <laughs> for auditing. That month to month it will fluctuate throughout the school year. Okay. All right. I had a quick question just on maybe just an educational question for my own benefit, but what's driving the reduction year on year in collection of revenues, whether that be from overall revenue, but also the ad valorem collections and things like that? What, what's going on there? In this month, again, we were still feeling the effects of, um, I think, the, the cyber attack on the city. They didn't still hadn't caught up. He, that we hadn't caught up yet. We hadn't caught up at, at the point of this report. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that for the, for Avalorum, that was the biggest thing. We didn't. We had not received a payment from them, and that will probably carry into the report I'll deliver next board meeting for November. Uh, that will be the November report. Yeah. But, but that's the biggest driver on Avalorum. Okay. Any other questions, comments? If not, is there a motion to approve the monthly financial report? So moved. Second. Mr. Figures has moved. Ms. Hill is seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 The motion carries. Next, we have our consent agenda items finance. All the pre consent, thank you, Mr. Burke. All the consent agenda items have been reviewed by the board previously and we've had an opportunity to ask questions of the administration. Are there any further questions? If not, is there a motion to approve our, our consent agenda items finance? Motion. Second. Mr. McGuffey has moved. Mr. Figures has seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 The motion carries. <coughs> Next, we have our consent agenda items. Was that, um, excuse me, was that finance? That was finance. Okay, general. Um, all of the consent agenda items general have been reviewed by the board previously and we've had an opportunity to ask questions of the administration. Are there any further questions? If not, is there a motion to approve the consent agenda items general? So moved. Second. Mr. McGuffey has moved. Ms. Hillier is seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 The motion carries. Next, we have the consent agenda items personnel. All the consent agenda items have been reviewed by the board previously and have had an opportunity to ask questions of the administration. Are there any further questions? If not, board members, is there a motion to approve the consent agenda personnel? So moved. Second. Ms. Hewitt has moved. Mr. Figures has seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 The motion carries. Uh, board members, before we go into the executive session, Mr. Bracey, I know I, I said we would hear your comment um, before we close, and so um, I will invite you to, to make the comment. We're going to follow the same rules that we do for public comment, so I'm just going to run through them one more time. Uh, though You have three minutes, uh, just like the people before, and um, Attorney Turner will keep the time. She'll signal at one minute when you've got a minute left. Uh, again, the board will listen, but we will not respond. Um, so at this time, Mr. Brace, I'll invite you to, to share your comment. Thank you. Uh, just more facts as far as Jackson Public School District. This is on uh, parentscampaign.com. And just um, it's Jackson Public School District state funding for the 2023-2024 school year is $6,861,384. Dollars below the amount required by state law. 
statewide Mississippi public schools are underfunded $175,829,477. This is, this is not it, though. This is the 16th consecutive year that Mississippi has underfunded to public schools. Since 2008, the last time the MAMP was fully funded, students in the JPS school district have been shorted a total of $185,000,000. Um, $584,623. During this same period, Mississippi raised its academic standards significantly, yet public schools have been denied, been denied the resources needed to meet those standards. So this is not an issue that haven't just happened. So these are the issues that need to be addressed. You know, we need to go back 16 years, not, not from 2016 into now. You know, so I have other facts. And this is um, what is the statute of charter schools in Mississippi, whereas the purposes of the Mississippi Charter Schools Act of 2013 are as follows, to improve student learning by creating high quality schools within high standards for student performance to close achievement gaps between high performing and low performance groups of public school students. So the, the, pub, the charter schools are failing us, you know? So these are issues that need to be addressed, you know, because the charter schools as a whole are elf schools. The majority of the schools that, that, that um, y'all are, are, like the optimization plan are talking about closing are A schools. So these are the issues that really need to be addressed. Because as the numbers as charter schools, it's like 88% are failing. You know, it's like an 11% ratio of the students at these charter schools are only meeting the standards at math. And then 8% are meeting the standards at reading. So that's like 89% of the students cannot read, you know. Well, 89% of the students, are, uh, they can't even do regular math things. And these are the things you need in life, you know, to count and to read. So the answers to all this is close these charter schools, get all this funding back, you know, and let's put all of, the, you know, and we're going to take this in legislation because it's against law for charter schools to be operating in schools, districts that are passing, you know, so. I understand the plans. I understand y'all concerns. So, you know, thank you. The community is going to stand up. You thank know? you. Thank you. Thank Absolutely. Thank you. you. Okay, board members. Um, we do have an item to consider for executive session. So, at this time, I'll take a motion to close uh, the meeting to consider executive session. I so move. Second. Mr. Figures has moved. Ms. Hilliard has seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. The motion carries. Thank you, everyone, and have a good evening.